In the days when the judges ruled, Elimelech's family, Naomi, Kilion, and Malon, went to Moab from Bethlehem because of a famine in Judah. Kilion and Malon married Moabite women, Orpah and Ruth. Elimelech, Kilion, and Malon all died. Naomi was left with two daughters-in-law. Naomi heard harvests in Judah were improving, so she decided to go back. She told Orpah and Ruth to stay behind in Moab, as their prospects would be better there. Orpah obeyed, but Ruth insisted on staying with Naomi. Naomi and Ruth arrived back in Bethlehem at the time of the barley harvest. Naomi was, perhaps understandably, somewhat bitter about the life she had been dealt. Ruth went gleaning and met Boaz, who owned the fields where she gleaned. Boaz treated her benignly, even kindly. He allowed her to glean, instructed the reapers to leave extra grain for her and protect her from molestation, and shared lunch with her. Boaz also turned out to be a relative of Elimelech. At the end of the harvest, Naomi instructed Ruth to visit Boaz at the threshing floor. She did this and asked him to marry her. Boaz noted that there was a nearer kinsman who must be asked first. The next day, Boaz asked the nearer kinsman, leaving the widow Ruth's age ambiguous. The kinsman declined, not wanting to marry someone who couldn't give him children. Boaz and Ruth married and had a son, Obed, who was also considered a son to Naomi. Thus was Elimelech's inheritance redeemed. Obed fathered Jesse, and Jesse fathered David. The time of the judges was from about 1380 BCE to 1050 BCE. During this time, the people of Israel and Judah had a series of leaders, and there was a cycle of unfaithfulness, defeat by enemies, repentance and restoration. The Book of Ruth doesn't tell us when within this period her story takes place. We do know that Ruth and Naomi arrived in Bethlehem at the start of the barley harvest, and that Ruth went out gleaning, that is to say, gathering the grain left over after the reapers had done their work. Rules regarding gleaning are mentioned in Leviticus chapter 19, verses 9 to 10, and Deuteronomy chapter 24, verses 19 to 22. Gleaning was a sort of early welfare system, ensuring that those without a way to grow their own food or buy it from others still had something to eat. Barley and wheat were overwintered crops, planted in autumn. The barley matured faster and was harvested first in the springtime, with the wheat harvest ending around seven weeks later. It's quite possible that Ruth's initial experience of eating lunch with Boaz and his workers was repeated and they would have been getting to know one another moderately well during this time. Nevertheless, her nighttime visit to the threshing floor was risque. To uncover his feet may have been a euphemism for a rather more intimate body part. Whether or not anything of a sexual nature happened that night on the threshing floor, Boaz and Ruth both knew the scandal that would erupt if other people thought she'd spent the night with him and she left before it was light enough to recognise others, with still more grain to take to her mother-in-law. Boaz was a kinsman of Elimelech. There was a tradition of something called leveret marriage, where if a landowning man married, but died before having left an heir, his siblings were obligated to marry his widow in order to maintain his name and the inheritance of his land. This was called redemption. In Ruth's story, we don't know what the relationship was between Boaz and Elimelech, or between Elimelech and the nearer kinsman who declines to marry Ruth and redeem Elimelech's inheritance. If this kinsman didn't know Ruth, it's quite possible that Boaz deceived him, telling him of Ruth, wife of the dead. He might have assumed that Ruth, not Naomi, was Elimelech's widow, and too old to bear children. This would explain his excuse of not wanting to endanger his own inheritance. There are several themes relevant to the life and faith of Israel in this story. 
Elimelech, Kilion, and Malon all die after emigrating to Moab, a country often in disagreements with Israel and with its own culture and religion. This supports the imprecations found in Ezra chapter 9 verses 1 to 2 and 12, and Nehemiah chapter 13 verses 23 to 25, to maintain racial and cultural purity and avoid intermarriage. But there is also space for a more inclusive attitude in the redemption of Elimelech's inheritance taking place through the commitment, loyalty and bravery of Ruth, a foreigner. The message here seems to be, assimilation is okay as long as it's in our direction, but also that God will redeem his people even when it seems, as it did to Naomi, that there is nothing to be happy or hopeful about. The model of Ruth, living with her mother-in-law and taking instruction from her as she learns her new culture, is still used for Jewish converts today. A convert is a ger, someone who dwells with the people of Israel. The book of Ruth is also still read in synagogues at Shavuot, a holiday associated with the end of the wheat harvest, and with the giving of the Torah to the Israelites, because of Ruth's desire to live in Israel with Naomi and to serve Naomi's God, as well as because of the story's timing with the harvest. Ruth's behaviour, along with that of Boaz, also reinforces the social care aspects of Israelite laws about supporting widows and the needy. Ruth was a widow herself and need not have accompanied Naomi to Bethlehem, but did so out of loyalty and care. The offer to glean to support them both may have been made out of necessity or out of altruism. Either way, gleaning is hard work, and Ruth doesn't shrink from it. Boaz treated Ruth kindly even when he didn't yet know her, and he was exemplary in his dealings throughout. For Christians today, Ruth's example of loyalty, commitment and care is still relevant. Her experience can't have been easy, but she was steadfast in her commitment to Naomi and to God. To me, the nature of Ruth's conversion also seems significant. We aren't told her motivations but it seems that she converted because of relationships with her deceased husband and with her mother-in-law, Naomi, who did not urge her to change her faith and home, but instead told her to stay in Moab. Naomi was bitter and grieving, but still wanted what was best for Ruth. I think when we engage with people of other cultures or faiths, it's important to have their best interests at heart and to be respectful of their desires and commitments. Ruth was an ancestor of David, and King David was an ancestor of Jesus. This Moabite woman, a foreigner, widowed, vulnerable, wasn't only participating in the redemption of Elimelech's name and inheritance. She was instrumental in preparation for the Incarnation, the birth of Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us. Like the Israelites, Some Christians today can be suspicious of newcomers, people we see as foreign or different in some way. If they're foreign and they need our help, sometimes our reaction is even worse. But a needy foreigner had a part to play in the salvation of the entire world. I think we should welcome the stranger, the alien, the disadvantaged and the despised, not only because of the Hebrew scriptures command to be kind to the stranger and alien, but because in the redemption of others lies our own redemption. The story of Ruth shows this powerfully.